You are listening to a sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana. Remain standing, if you will, as I read from Genesis chapter 4, our text for the morning. Now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you? You are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive, a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. You may be seated. We return to Adam and Eve this morning in their new home, somewhere to the east of the garden's entrance, across the way from the green hill upon which God's garden temple resided, guarded by the cherubim. Our first parents have been exiled from the garden, and have been clothed in God's mercy. They've started their new life together as sinners living in a fallen world. And so we read in verse 1, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. Now think with me for a minute what this experience would have been like for these first parents. Though God had designed them for the business of pregnancy and childbirth, and he had told them to expect children as part of his promises to them, neither Adam nor his wife had ever seen another human being give birth before. They'd seen animals conceive and give birth to be sure, but never another mother. Imagine the wonder, the awe, the shock, the delight, even the terror of being the first woman to ever give birth. The first husband to see your wife go through that. But after the travails of the first labor, Eve brought her first son into the world. And and what a joy he was. She named him Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. Cain's name shares the common root with the Hebrew word forgotten. It can also mean to acquire or secure. We might say that Eve named her son the begotten one. 
latent in his name is the presence of high hopes. He brought to Adam and Eve a confirmation that life would go on, that God keeps his promises. Indeed, he was the fulfillment of God's promises that Eve would bear children and that Adam would have a son. And perhaps, just maybe, maybe he was the promised one, the chosen one, who would defeat the serpent on their behalf. Could it be? However, also latent in Eve's naming of Cain lies a sour note, a hint of pride. Notice the order of nouns in Eve's statement about Cain. It's the same in the Hebrew. I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. Who comes first? Who's the co-pilot? The way Eve names her son reveals something of a boast. I think of Tom Hanks' character in Castaway. After all those days, he finally gets that big bonfire going and says, Look what I have created! That's Eve. Look what I've done. I've made a man. Oh, and Yahweh help me. By contrast, what do they name their second son? They name him Abel. Actually, in Hebrew, it's Hevel. Hevel is the word of Ecclesiastes that's translated throughout that book, vanity of vanities. It means fleeting, vaporous, transitory. No account for why Abel is given this name is given, but, but it doesn't bode well, does it? His life won't amount to much. And here I think we also have a glimpse of a little patriarchal favoritism for the oldest son. All hopes are pinned on Cain and Abel counts for nothing. That brings us to three points of our sermon, which are as follows. An offering, a murder, and a curse. First, an offering. Verse 2 introdu introduces us to the career paths of these two sons of Adam. Cain is a farmer like his father. Abel is a shepherd like David. The younger brother gets the dirty job. But the point of introducing their lines of work is to introduce their worship of the Lord. Verse 3 says, In the course of time, Cain brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock in their fat portions. In the course of time, after many days, at the end of the growing season, whatever it is, Cain decided to bring an offering to the Lord God, a tribute now, this doesn't seem to have been commanded. We don't have any sign of any precedent here. Though I'd wager that Cain and Abel have seen their father Adam worship the Lord at the entrance to the garden between the cherubim. And they'd seen him do it many times before. But I get the impression that here is Cain on his own initiative, bringing an offering to the Lord. Cain seems like a good, God-honoring fellow, doesn't he? And like Manel, Abel, seeing his older brother bring an offering to Yahweh, brought his own offering. Abel, being a shepherd, doesn't have fruits and veggies to offer, which is what Cain brought. But he took some of his sheep to God in worship. However, Abel doesn't just take any sheep. He took the firstborn of his sheep and of their fatty portions. Now, if you've been trained in the law of Moses like a good Israelite who was the first to hear this story, you would recognize this language. You would recognize that what God desires and delights to see in worship and what he lays claim to is the firstborn and the firstfruits. 
The fatty portions of the animals offered to him in sacrifice are reserved for him. Indeed, when we come to God in worship, he wants the first and the best, whether it's from the field or from the flock. Thus, Abel was not just bringing an offering to God. He was bringing the best offering to God that he could muster, the best of his flock, the best of their meat, the stuff that would smell the best in a burnt sacrifice. Abel's heart was fully engaged in worship because he gave God his best. And so we ask ourselves as we look back, wait, did Cain bring his first fruits? What's going on here? Next we read in verses 4 and 5, And Yahweh had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering he had no regard. Uh Uh-oh. The oldest, the one who took the initiative in worship, the one who could do no wrong in his parents' eyes, probably, he's passed over in worship. God delights instead in the offering of Abel and in Abel himself. More literally, the Hebrew says that God gazed upon Abel Abel and his offering. God had eyes for Abel at that moment. He paid attention to him. He gladly received Abel's worship. And by gazing upon Abel, Yahweh made his face to shine upon Abel and be gracious to him. He honored Abel. So God blessed Abel in worship. He did not bless Cain's worship. And note that Cain's offering is not criticized. It's not condemned. Rather, God simply didn't recognize Cain's offering. It was functionally ignored. It's as if it wasn't even there. But by doing so, God rejected Cain's worship as substandard. And in rejecting Cain's worship as substandard, God communicated that Cain was substandard. And with that, Cain's face fell. He became very angry. His confidence turned sour. And his face fell into a scowl. Now, before we move into the next point, It's worth talking about what we can learn from this experience of worship between these two boys. Hebrews 11.4 tells us, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Despite what Cain's worship looked like on the outside, Scripture tells us that his worship was performative. You know what performative means. It's what people do on Twitter or X and Facebook when you jump on the bandwagon of the latest outrage. Virtue signaling. Going through the motions, putting on a show of righteousness that's performative. And presumptuous. He presumed, he assumed that he was in a better standing with God than he actually was. He assumed that his worship would be accepted well because he was the one offering it. He didn't need to put a lot of thought or effort into his worship. He didn't need to bring God his best. He was the best. He was Adam's eldest. He was the begotten one. And so he brought to God an offering that was little more than a token gesture. Meanwhile, Abel approached God as number two, the lesser, perhaps as a neglected younger brother. He didn't have the honored position in the family, and so he felt his need for God's grace more deeply. 
His name meant nothing. He appreciated every gift of God more fully. And as a result, he saw reason. No, he saw absolute need to bring God his best. How could he do otherwise? That's at the center of Cain's heart was Cain. And at the center of Abel's heart was Yahweh. This speaks to how we worship today. First, it begs the question, who are we seeking? Are we seeking ourselves in worship or are we seeking Jesus? Are you coming to God in order to get something from him like he is some cosmic vending machine? I come in, I put in my worship tokens, and I get back warm fuzzies. I feel better about myself. I'm comforted. Are you coming to God to get something from him, or are you coming to God to get him? To get God himself, to get Jesus himself. Are you coming to worship and adore God, or are you coming so that God can worship and adore you? Second, it begs the question of what we offer to God in worship. Do you assume that, of course, God will accept you and be pleased with you? Do you think that because God accepts you in Christ, that it really doesn't matter what you do in worship? It doesn't matter if you're on time. It doesn't matter if you sing. It doesn't matter if or how much you tithe. That it doesn't matter what you offer God or how you offer it. Friends, Cain is living proof, and he's the first story in the Bible that shows us that God cares very, very much about how we worship him and what we bring him in worship. Being covered by the grace of Jesus does not mean that we can be lazy in how we approach God in church. If his grace doesn't drive us to deep sincerity and costly participation in worship, then we've not really understood God's grace. It's easy to presume upon God's grace rather than rejoice in God's grace. Don't be like that. Don't be like Cain. And understand, friends, God is not obligated to bless or accept what you present him in worship. I'll say that again. God is not obligated to bless or or accept what you present him in worship. Second point, a murder. Now, when Cain saw that he was rejected, his face fell and he grew sullen, very angry. You wonder if this was the first time anybody had really told him no. But how does God respond? He, he responds like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He responds like he will with Adam. I mean, not with Adam, with Jonah on the hillside overlooking Nineveh. He asked Cain, why are you angry? Why do you look so sullen? And he says, look, if you do well, you know you'll be accepted, Right? If you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, contrary to you, and you must rule over it. God's saying to Cain, look, look, bud, all's not lost. It's not the end of the world. The path is open to your restoration, to your acceptance, and to your blessing. You just have to do better. If you do better, if you do well, if you worship me properly, 
from a heart of faith rather than a heart of self-righteousness, then you'll be accepted and I will personally lift your face. However, if you don't do well, if you continue down the path that you're currently on, beware, Cain. Sin is crouching at the door like a lion stalking its prey. And if you go that way, it is going to pounce on you. It is going to destroy your life because its desire is for you. It's hungry. You've got to rule over those desires, Cain. You've got to be the master of your emotional life and your impulses. Can't let them master you. And understand that God is telling Cain that, Bud, right now, the conflict of Genesis 3.15 is waging war inside of you. Cain's heart is the first battleground between the serpent and the Holy One. The serpent's coiled and ready to strike. Will Cain crush the serpent within or will he open himself up to death? As we move forward in the story, notice that Cain doesn't say anything back to Yahweh. Instead, he talks to his brother. We don't know what he said. The Septuagint and older translations add he invited his brother into the field. But we do find ourselves presumably in Cain's field where he grows his protos and out there in the field, out of sight of the cherubim, away from mom and dad, there Cain rose up against his brother and murdered him. This is the language of intentional, premeditated, meditated, first degree murder. Plain and simple. How did this happen? At one level, Cain grew murderous because he let his pride get the better of him. He was supposed to be the chosen one. He was the one who should have received God's blessing. How could God pass over him in order to show favor to little Abel. It's not right. Cain couldn't take the shame of being passed over, and so his solution was to eliminate his feeling of shame by eliminating the one he felt shamed him, was the source of his shame. However, there's a deeper level to this murder. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 3, 12, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Meredith Klein writes, Cain's murder of Abel was not the upshot of a merely social or civil disagreement. It was in the cult, at the altar of worship, that enmity had broken out. Cain's hatred flared when the Lord exposed the hypocrisy of his act of worship. It was because he was in league with the deceitful serpent that he could not be accepted at the sacred place. Cain's quarrel was with the Lord God and only with Abel because he was the one accepted by the Lord. This violence was an erupting of the predicted conflict between the serpent's seed and the seed of the woman. So you see, Cain was really mad at God. But he he couldn't exactly strike God down. He couldn't deal with his God problem. He could deal with his Abel problem. He could strike at the man that God favored. He he could strike at the man, man who made him feel so guilty and condemned by God. Now, it wasn't that Abel had done anything to judge or condemn or shame Cain. Abel's mere existence, his faith, his sincerity, his righteousness, and God's evident blessing upon him. That became a grating wine within Cain's conscience. Abel's faith felt like a taunt against Cain. 
And so Cain made his brother the first martyr. He murdered him to silence his own guilt. Here's the application before we move to our last point. Beware of sin, my friends. Beware especially of pride and self-righteousness. The devil prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He can grab a hold of you when you least expect it, even in worship. After all, Cain set out that day to go to church. He thought he was doing well. But things changed somewhere in there. His self-righteousness, his self-assurance was confronted, and he hated it. He wasn't prepared for God to be displeased with him. He wasn't prepared for God to accept someone else, to bless someone else. He wasn't able to handle the fact that his heart, his worship, were not as good as he thought they were. It was Cain's self-righteousness confronted with the actual righteousness of Abel that drove him to murder. In the same way, it was the self-righteousness of the, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the priests when they were confronted with the actual righteousness of Jesus Christ that drove them to demand he be crucified. These were people who were trying to worship God. In their day, they, they would have thought, they would have been viewed as the cream de la cream of spirituality and Christian discipline. They thought they knew God, but they could not stomach the revelation that their goodness was actually vile and offensive to God. That they were opposing God. Indeed, self-righteousness is a subtle, crafty sin that looks very good. It looks harmless. It's very easy to bring into worship. But it leads to hatred and murder. Don't tolerate it. It is a bitter root in your heart that opposes everything that is truly, truly of faith and righteousness. That brings us to the third point, a curse. Following his murder of Abel, Yahweh once again speaks to Cain. He seeks him out and asks him, Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now, as with Adam and Eve, God knew the answer. This question is to see if Cain will fess up, if he will admit the truth, if he will show signs of repentance. But unlike his father Adam, Cain responded to God rudely and with a bold-faced lie. His likeness to the serpent is becoming even more plain as he says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now think how childish, how selfish, evil even this reply is. And think also that this is not a sudden turnaround in Cain's character. Nobody changes for the bad this quickly. These thoughts, these motives, this attitude towards his brother, am I my brother's keeper? This has been in his heart for a long time. This is why his worship was substandard beneath the veneer of self-righteousness. It was just masked over by success and self-confidence and the veneer of religion. Cain's response reveals that he is not sorry. He is not repentant. He still hates his brother, even with his brother being dead. What's more, he hates God as revealed in his tone. He's bought the lie of the serpent fully. He sees God now as a cosmic bully, overly demanding, unfair, and taxing. So he lashes out at God with hostile words, and God responds with appropriate fury. What have you done? This is not the gentle question. 
that we've seen before. This is a, what have you done? This is the language, the question of a parent when you come in and you see your child having destroyed something incredibly valuable. What have you done? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. You didn't think you could get away with this, did you, Cain? That you brother buried your brother in the field. The field itself is crying out to me and testifies to his death at your hands. You have watered your field with the blood of your brother. Therefore, God says, curse to you from the ground, curse to you from the field, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. When you work the ground, it will no longer give you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now, when God says, curse to you from the ground, two things are going on here. For, for one, God was saying to Cain, you are banished from the ground. I'm separating you from the nourishment of the ground. Your career up to this point, Cain, has been that of a farmer. You provided for yourself and your family by means of the fruit of the earth. No longer. Your difficulties with the ground will be worse than Adam's because in no ways will you be able to extract from it support and strength. It will not provide for you. It will not nourish you. Instead, you are going to be a hunter-forager because you can't grow anything. You'll be a nomad, a fugitive, a vagabond on the earth, unstable and restless in all your ways. You'll be an exile on the earth, from the earth. And also, God, God is saying, you are cursed more than the ground. In Genesis 3.17, God had cursed the ground itself. By doing so, he was withholding the brunt of his wrath from Adam. Cain is the first human being to be cursed by God. Personally. He is a vessel of God's wrath from this moment forward. And he bears it in a way beyond the earth itself does because of Adam's sin. Now let's look at Cain's response to this curse. He says, in effect, that's not fair. I can't take that. It's too much. Cain is the first person to feel more sorry for the consequences of his crime than for committing the crime. He's not sorry he killed Abel. He's sorry he's being punished for it. This is worldly grief. This is how the world, this is how a carnal man, a sinful, unrepentant, unregenerate man or woman responds to the consequences of sin. It's not fair. I don't deserve this. And what is Cain fearful of? What is, is he complaining about more than anything? He's fearful for his own life. Oh, the irony. Here's Cain. He's just killed his brother. And what he, is he afraid of? That one of his brothers is going to seek vengeance and kill him. He fears that he will be justly executed for his unjust crime against his brother. You know, Cain's fine with killing as long as he's the one doing it. But here God's bizarre and amazing grace finds Cain, though it's better to call it mercy because it's not a blessing. It's a sparing. In the face of Cain's agony and fear of death, God says, not, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Complete vengeance. Well-rounded vengeance for a murderer. Here God utters an oath of divine protection over Cain's head. Cain, the murderer. Cain, the first in the line of the serpent. Yes, God protects even him 
from the just consequences of his actions. God decrees that if anyone executes Cain, that God himself will act as Cain's avenger. And as a sign for all, Cain included, God put a sign on Cain, something like a tattoo or Harry Potter scar. Something that was universally recognizable and symbolic. Cain becomes at this moment a marked man, both as a murderer and as someone who is under divine protection. I want to puzzle over this for a second. Because God does not act as the righteous avenger for the faithful man, does he? He doesn't decree sevenfold justice for the death of righteous Abel, does he? Instead, he decrees sevenfold justice against anyone who executes justice on the murderer. Why? Perhaps it's because God is trying to prevent the escalation of bloodshed. If a blood feud begins at this stage in human history, then it's not going to get very far. Not only will Cain and his descendants die, but so will many of the faithful descendants of Adam and Eve. So will the children of Seth, who is to come, and that should be avoided. However, more than that, I think that God is merciful to Cain because God is being merciful to Adam. God spares the son out of his love for the father. In 1 Kings 11, 11, we read, Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. There's, there's a principle in Scripture that God spares the sons their just deserts because of his covenant, commitment, and love for the father who is faithful. It's not because Cain deserves God's mercy that he spares him the sword. It's because Adam deserves God's mercy. God has made promises to Adam. So it's not so much that God spares Cain death, rather he spares Adam Cain's death. In God's eyes, it's enough that Adam has lost Abel to his brother. It's enough that Cain is sent into exile as a murderer and spiritual ally of Adam's enemy. But to lose two sons to death in one day would be an unbearable grief. Even if one of them is a murderer and a snake. That brings us to the conclusion. The bulk of the story of Genesis is the story of brothers. These brothers are born of faithful men called by God. They're given the sign of the covenant. They're taught the word of God and they see God's faithfulness to their fathers. And yet in just about every generation, someone reveals themselves to be spiritually aligned with the serpent. They reveal themselves to be selfish and carnally minded. But showing up in every story and every generation is the steadfast, sovereign love of God. And at the end of the day, in every story, it's God's sovereign covenant love that saves the day. It's God's mercy that spares the hard-hearted offspring. And His steadfast love that guarantees a future for the child of promise. One of the things this story teaches us is that the first place that sin reveals itself is in the home. Even godly, faithful parents don't escape this reality. The story of Cain and Abel proves a harsh wake-up call for all of us who are parents. It reveals that some of our children, raised in the faith, heirs of the covenant, may have hard hearts. 
They may make terrible choices. They may reveal themselves to be aligned with the enemy. And what's worse, there's nothing that we can do about it. Except pray for God's mercy. Parents, I can't stand up here today and tell you and promise you that if you raise your children right, they'll all turn out to be faithful Christians with successful lives. Scripture does not promise you that. No, based on the testimony of Scripture, some of your children or grandchildren will be devils. However, I can promise you in the words of Jesus, everyone who has lost houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children, lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. As painful as it is, for faithful parents to lose their children to the enemy or to violence. Jesus promises us that we have an inheritance and a family waiting for us in glory that is imperishable and that will fill us with immeasurably greater joy. Though the devil strike at our families, friends, though he claim lives, he will not win. He will not be victorious because Christ's mercy is more. Thank you for listening to this sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana, where you will always find biblical preaching, meaningful worship, and the equipping of disciples. For more information on River Community Church and its ministries, please visit rivercommunity.org.